Hey, welcome back to Mobility Watt Pro. We are gonna take on a new diagnosis series. And we're gonna start with a common running pathology or problem called runner's knee. Now, runner's knee is one of those esoteric catch-all phrases when you get a diagnosis. That is, something is wrong with your knee, it typically hurts when you run. So it's very non-specific. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a chunk of the common pathology or common signs and symptoms that relate to this runner's knee catch-all and today we're going to talk about the patella or the kneecap. And typically when people refer to runner's knee, they're talking about either iliotibial syndrome, they've got pain around the knee, or they've got a dysfunction around the kneecap like uh, the back of the kneecap is flaking or the cartilage is painful or some aspect of the kneecap. Jumper's knee sometimes gets thrown in here and that would be a diagnosis around sort of the patellar ligament or the, the tendon, the tendinosis between the, the, the patella and the knee itself. And since that's bone to bone, it's technically a ligament. So we'll take that on in a second episode. Today what we want to do is give you an overview of how this happens and some of the easy low level pieces that make a difference in terms of addressing this problem. Because once this has risen to a pain level problem that's interfering with your knee running, you're running in your knee, it, it, it has your attention. And sometimes it's a difficult bell to stop ringing. So for Star Wars, so let me go and show you you know, if we take a look at the patella, what we're looking at here is this kind of a side view of the of the the leg, right? The fibula is on the outside here. So what we're looking at is the right leg. Here's the front of the knee, so you can orientate yourself. This is the insertion ultimately of your quadriceps as it comes down to a common tendon of the patella and ends up in this tibia. And this is the tibial tuberosity. So this is when we talk about Osgood slaughters or jumpers knee later on, we're gonna talk about this relationship. But today we're gonna to focus on the patella. The patella is what's called a sesamoid bone. It's a bone that shows up inside a ligament. And literally it allows us to create mechanical advantage of the quadriceps in terms of flexing the knee and extending the hip. Um, it, protect, it gives us, uh, it, it allows this, this long quadriceps system to literally go over the very complex yet miraculous joint of the knee. But when people get hot around the patella, we have some kind of patellar tendinopathy, patellar related problem. Typically, we're, we're, people are saying, hey, I have this nondescript or non specific pain in this area. So, what we want to do first is when you have identified this problem, for us, it, it falls into two categories. The first category is an incident level problem. And so, I'm just going to write down the word incident here. And what that means is, hey, I went for a run, and now my knee hurts. Can you grab me another pen? So I went for a run, and now my, my patella hurts. Or oftentimes we see that runners will um, end up running, and then they have to sit for a long time, and their kneecap hurts. And that's actually called theater sign or movie sign. And it's a sign that the patella is under compression. So let's break this out for you. So typically, the first thing you want to do, thank you very much, is when we see these related problems, what I want you to think is, hey, this usually around, around the patella falls into two categories. And the first category is over tension. And simply put, over tension in this incident level problem, why is it not a, an injury yet? Because it hasn't been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're still running, it just hurts. And this injury is when we start to address related problems in an, in an area where it says I can no longer perform my role and, and my life or work or I can no longer perform my sport or I've disrupted the, the tissue sufficiently that I have to have a surgical or serious medical intervention, i.e. I've worn a hole through my kneecap now and it's grinding and it's bleeding the, no, the, the joint is diffused or I'm going to have to have some kind of surgery. So we're trying to really capture these things on this incident level side. Now over tension is a simple idea that what, what ends up happening is nothing has changed in the conversation um, around your mechanics. So you haven't changed your shoes, nothing occult has gone on with, um, you know, you haven't fallen and injured your kneecap, something like this hasn't occurred. And subsequently, typically most of the time we start to ask this question when we see this, this common problem with kneecap in the over tension is, hey, something has changed in the environment of the human. So we'll ask, have you upped your, your volume, right? Have you done more uh, sitting? Have you recovered less? 
we want to get to the understanding of what triggered this overtensioned related problem. And overtension just means that the system is under too much mechanical tension. And a good example is if you sit at the edge of a table here, and I sit with my back straight, so I'm, I'm not overextended, I'm just maintaining my back, I should be able to extend my leg without any lumbar reversal loss. So here's a good example of if that I, if I sit at the edge of a table, and I'm nice and tall, and I should be able to extend my leg, in fact I should be able to extend both legs with no lumbar loss. So you can videotape yourself, also watch what's happening. And what's happening here is that as I extend, if I'm, my quadriceps, which are pulling the leg up in this range, are over tensioned, or I have too much stiffness in the system, or I have, for example, stiff hamstrings or a motor control around the posterior chain of hamstrings, some reason the quadriceps are working and don't have full range. Because remember, I should be able to get my, easily in this position, I should be able to sit tall. In fact, I should be able to overextend, sit tall. I should be able to round and come back to flat with both legs up. And what you can see is that if this quadriceps, this rectus femoris, which is the strap of the femur that crosses the hip and the knee, is over tight, and it's wor I'm working against myself, then what happens is that patella can become overly compressed into the kneecap, which is enough to cause an irritation in that joint, or I have an insertional related problem where the quadriceps common tendon of, the, le of the, the thigh musculature is coming into the knee and I've irritated that insertion. So you can understand now that if I'm sitting in a long car ride and my kneecap starts to ache, the mechanism of that is that the kneecap is on pretty significant tension here and what ends up happening is that these tissues become ischemic because they're locked or have low oxygen, low perfusion as they get locked at end range, and the kneecap is just under this kind of low grade drag, this low grade pull. So that kind of defines overtension. Overtension can be made worse by the fact that if I'm a heel striker and I somehow develop stiffness in the quadriceps system or downstream in the anterior shin system, what ends up happening then is, is I translate over. I don't have the hamstring control, knee trends to slap down and come forward quickly, and what has happened is I put a vector load in the middle of this quadriceps system. So this overtension can be related to just the mechanics. So I have mechanical strain, which is means like, hey, I have the handbrake on because my quads are stiff or my hamstrings are stiff, or I have a motor control related problem that relates into I'm doing something like heel striking that my tissues can no longer buffer. And one of the best advocate, uh, best kind of cases for learning how to run correctly is that this position can cause a lot of problems. As I load through the heel, I have to create a lot of co-contraction in the system to, down, to slow down. And if I have a stiff tissue system and a heel strike, boom, that puts that patella under smack load. We can tend to see this pattern show up when people squat without a hip, hamstring uh, sort of driven movement. Those people who are over tension and susceptible and, and sensitive to this will tend to squat by shooting the kneecap out forward. And when we say vector load, what I'm talking about is, is instead of easily distributing load through a system from the start and the, and the, and the bottom, when my kneecap suddenly translates through that, system and you can imagine now that here's the quadriceps and then the knee comes forward as that knee comes forward that introduces a two to one mechanical advantage and so you know if we say sometimes that if I put a car into a ditch and just tied a rope to the bumper into a tree I could have my friends pull on this rope from the middle we can literally pull the car out of the ditch because we're able to create a two to one mechanical advantage so when that kneecap comes through here we're not realizing that the forces are doubled on the kneecap even though the kneecap is already experiencing a, a weighted load of two to three times body weight so we can suddenly get a massive massive compression and because the mechanical advantage is so close, that kneecap is so close to the insertion, it has it creates a lot of mechanical uh, leverage here, this rotational leverage, and, it, it, and I tend to see a lot more compression than if my kneecap was right here. Okay, so the idea here is one, is this a motor control related problem? So I'm, how am I running, right? If I always run like this, if I had this problem before, when this happens, 
mechanical strain through overtension tends to be the, the chief culprit. And when we address this as a whole, we, what we're doing then, whoop, grabbed the wrong one, is that we're going to start to solve this problem by thinking in two ways. One, how am I going to improve perfusion? So what I want to do is make sure that the tissue is as healthy and has as big a blood flow as possible and that that inflamed state is being addressed. So if I have swelling, then what's happening is I'm going to adopt strategies that help me address the swelling, like compression, like voodoo, um, like using a Mark Pro or an, a neuromuscular, um, neuromuscular electric stim unit, NMES, like a Mark Pro here or Compex. And what's happening here is that if I'm addressing this, I'm thinking, hey, as long as there's swelling in there and I, have, I basically have an, a really unhealthy system, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to improve the health quality of the system by getting rid of the swelling, improve the blood flow by doing either some compression and some release, right? I'm gonna to try to pump out the swelling in this area and try to bring the garbage out and bring the groceries in. So that's sort of my, my first level of sort of intervention, is saying I, I've injured these tissues, they've, I've sensitized them, they're swollen, I wanna improve the health by addressing in this, this sort of modality. The second thing that we do see makes a big difference is that we wanna, we're gonna call it build, feed slack or develop slack. So how do I create slack in the mechanical system to free up and sort of ameliorate or attenuate some of the compressive forces on the kneecap. Now notice, both of these sets of strategies have nothing to do with changing how you're actually squatting, changing how you're actually running, or potentially looking at this, what we call biopsychosocial model, saying, well, what environmental load are you putting on the knee? Are you walking around in high heel shoes all day long? Are you sitting all day long? Are you not moving all day long and still expecting your tissues to rebound from these difficult runs and difficult squat sessions? So, before we talk more about this, let's put a pin in environment, environment, which again is a biopsychosocial BPS model of saying, hey, look, we've got to have to have a conversation about what's going on in the other 23 hours of your day. And then we'll down here, we'll say, hey, look, you may need to address your movement quality through actually doing some running drills, right? And what's interesting in here is that there is a relationship between these two behaviors. So for example, a lot of times when we ask people, hey, what's going on, what's changed? They'll say, hey, I have, I have a brand new shoe, my volume has ramped up suddenly and miraculously, I've been flying back and forth to the East Coast, hey, I know I've been stiff but I'm getting behind, or oh, I stopped doing my daily mobilization work. Right? Oh, I haven't been squatting or doing anything. So we tend to see changes in behavior that we're keeping this at bay and we're allowing us to buffer this incomplete mechanic. The other thing that this movement environment relationship usually shows us is that we see that athletes are literally running out the door and have no warm up. So this is a wonderful place to be talking about warm up. How are you getting the tissues ready to absorb that number of loads and that number of, of iterations of, of striking? Whether I'm running correctly or not, what we see is that most of the athletes who end up with this runner's knee related patellar problem are, aren't really warm and what we have is tissues that don't ex aren't very extensible suddenly under this compressive load. It, and so this is a big deal. We ask our athletes, are you warming up? And then also after your run, what are you doing to cool down? Are you jumping into a car? Are you sitting back in that meeting? Those tissues are gonna get stiff if you don't continue to move them afterwards. So if you have a standing desk or a standing moving station, this is a good indicator that, hey, your environment is encouraging sort of this symbiotic relationship between the movement practice and what's going on. And uh, at the very least, you're thinking, hey, I'm not gonna run and then just jump in a car. I'm not gonna run and jump on this flight. I'm gonna see if I can do some standing and moving, even if I can't do my mobilizations right afterwards. But besides warm up and cool down, besides thinking about the environment, environmental load on this tissue system, what we still are addressing was, hey, 
I may be able to deal with this stuff in time, but up front, I've got to make sure that I'm, I'm dealing with this. So let's take kind of these things on a little bit. So when we think about programming, and we think about a tissue that has suddenly become sensitized to the point where my brain is picking it up as a biomechanical problem, in this overtension world, the first thing again we want you to think about is dealing with perfusion, and we're going to call this desensitization. We've got to desensitize, and what ends up what that means is that if I choose to do a voodoo floss wrap here, right, or um, I'm getting some compression, that this is a way of sometimes taking a local injured site, a local uh, sensitized site, and through movement, basically, or through some compression or some tooling, this is a way that I can bring uh, those, those pain receptors offline, that they're not screaming for attention. So anything that relates to this, you know, um, around improving the health of the localized tissue and also desensitizing is one about kind of improving the environment. But then we start to think about slack. And the first thing that we need people to remember about slack is I need to work upstream of the area and downstream of the area. Typically, when people are thinking about knee pain, they're like, hey, I'm having some kind of patellar compression here. And here's an example. I have a young girl who has grown and grown and grown. She's grown six inches in the last six months. Her, we know that her soft tissues are gonna lag behind bony growth. So suddenly the system has come very tight. Nothing has changed around her warm up or cool down. Nothing has changed around her environment except that she sits all day. She's grown really fast. Well, suddenly I have a lot of additional strain in the system. Now, when we talk about overtension, remember that we can typically see this quickly when we ask people to, to perform full range of motion. So I say, hey, can you squat all the way down to the ground? And even before they have a painful kneecap with running, they'll be like, ah, oh, maybe it's a little sensitive, but if, as long as they stay out of that range, it's fine. We can use a, a daily squat as a diagnostic tool, and we can see us moving out of these stable shapes, stable archetypes, so that when I see the foot turn out, or I see the knee turn in during a squat or a run, that's sort of a red flag for me that, hey, I'm either having a motor control running landing problem, or, hey, these tissues are so stiff, that I'm the athlete is trying to buy themselves some, some slack. This requires less quadriceps tissue range than this position does. So what we're thinking is, okay, if I have a movement practice, I'm starting to see the athlete deviate away from stable positions into positions that we call the broken archetype, which may indicate tissue stiffness, but if I don't know how an athlete moves, I might be able to improve how the kneecap is getting compressed into the joint simply by working on building slack into this tissue from upstream and downstream. So here's an example. When I have an athlete who comes in and says, hey, my kneecap is hot, or I'm having pain in the kneecap, right? The first thing that we think is, is I don't want to compress that kneecap any further. I don't necessarily want to pull on the kneecap either. So movements, like the couch stretch, I did it again. Movements like the couch stretch or common traditional quad stretches I tend to avoid. So these are the things that say, hey, maybe what I don't want to do is irritate that tissue that way, right? It's already sensitized to compression load. So what I think about is, how can I feed soft tissue slack? So instead of stretching, I work on soft tissue mobilization. So soft tissue mobilizations. And that can be a quad smash, for example. I could voodoo the, the, the pouch of the knee. I could work on opening up the high hip, the high hip flexor. I could look at the shin. And suddenly all you're seeing is that I'm working on discovering and having a conversation about building capacity in the system. So for example, if it turns out this quadriceps system is stiff 
and I really do 10 minutes of good smashing here, or I realize that, hey, this rectus femoris is very stiff, then if I soften that, that may be enough to build a little capacity so that when the knee is getting compressed, that the build tension curve isn't so high, so it's not getting so compressed early, and that may be enough to immediately desensitize it. The suprapatellar pouch, for example, is this pouch of tissue right above your knee. Supra means above knee, suprapatellar, right above the kneecap. And what we know is that is when this area gets stiff, and oftentimes it gets stiff because as I sit here, it becomes adhered to the, the area. So suddenly when I bend my knee, and then run my knee through that tish, stiff system, because right here, hey, that's no problem, but as soon as my kneecap comes forward at all, like I was running, then I experience large levels of compression and weird off-angle pulling of the quadriceps tendon onto the kneecap. So one of the things that we do is, hey, we'll floss this, so we'll you know, get the voodoo band, compress about this area, and then just do some easy motion to try to separate out the tissue, lay on a lacrosse ball, take care of this band, right? Working on the high hip flexor with bandage distractions with the leg straight. But also we tend to forget that when I pull on the shin here, that fascial line, that connective tissue, is contiguous with the whole system. So if I'm stiff in the front of the shin, and my, this anterior tib is tight, the, the patellar ligament is kind of tacked down in this area because I haven't done anything with it, is that that's enough to create another additional shear load, compressor load, through range onto the patella. So what I'm thinking here is, hey, in the front, how can I build tissue slack from the upstream? How can I build tissue slack from the downstream? We tend to forget that a stiff gas rock, if I can't extend my leg all the way, one of the things, because my calves are tight, one of the things that happens is that the quadriceps has to work really hard to work in that. If we have a knee, that cap, that a leg that's stuck bent, oftentimes when we have our athletes squeeze their leg and straighten out, what we find is that they're missing terminal knee extension. We can put this into our mechanics piece, terminal knee extension. We have a, plenty of videos about addressing that. It's also in Supple Leopard. But suddenly now, if I'm missing range of motion of this joint, the knee is stuck bent, every single load, every single movement of the knee initiates with extra additional compression into the kneecap. So what you're seeing here is that rarely does this spontaneously happen out of nothing. Typically we've seen an environmental change, um, a change in, in workload, a change in shoes, a change in environmental strain. I see errors in behavior around warming up and cooling down. I see people tend to be very stressed when these things happen. Um, the volume of the, of the run has ramped up. Then we tend to see, hey, there's tissues that have been overstressed, over tension for a long time, and suddenly you fall below what we used to call the suck line, and your tissues start sucking because they can't put up with it. So when you think hot kneecap, what you're thinking is, I have a tissue that can no longer buffer the compressive forces on it. And what we're thinking is, hey, where the rats get in is not where they chew. So you're gonna have to heal this short-term problem. So if we're looking at tissue healing, this can be two to four weeks of letting the tissues remodel, of letting them kind of desensitize. Thinking of it as a sprained ankle of your kneecap. And the rest of the time, there's a ton of things you can do to make that kneecap become less painful immediately by feeding slack, by getting warm, by making sure you have full range of motion, by not trying to put the kneecap under kind of constant passive strains. And suddenly, when we take this multidisciplinary approach, we take this biopsychosocial approach, what we see is that we can, not any single one factor is the problem, it's the ecosystem of the problem. So this is hot kneecap part one tomorrow, or the next time we take it, we're gonna talk about iliotibial band syndrome, but think, over tension typically is the problem, and uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow.